A warm welcome to the program today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week, Diplomatic Channel goes all the way to the African Union Summit holding in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where leaders are calling for greater representation at the UN. Also in the agenda is coups in Africa, four of them, and what the AU has decided. It's a second major meeting holding during the pandemic. Speaking of which, Economies on the continent have been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic. Last year's African Economic Conference sought to provide solutions for governments such as debt refinancing, debt renegotiation, and how to raise that $425 billion required to recover from COVID-19. While covering the conference in December 2021, I had a chat with Joseph Menser, the Principal Policy Advisor, Macroeconomics and Governance Division of the UN's Economic Commission for Africa on how Africa can recover from the economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and what nations should do to prepare against the next pandemic. Then, US sources say Russia is 70% ready to invade Ukraine. Having assembled about 70% of the military capability needed for a full-scale invasion in the coming weeks. Oh, as usual, let's begin with what else is in the news in the world of diplomacy. Sweden's honorary consul, Philip Ackerson, says though his main duty in Lagos will be to serve the Swedish community, he intends to work towards greater cooperation and partnership between Nigeria and Sweden. It's also a very strong presence uh, in Lagos and across Nigeria of Swedish companies such as ABB, Scania, Ericsson and two days ago it was actually announced uh, that Africa's largest VC fund um, uh, will open up and a lot of investments will go to Nigeria as part of that supporting local tech companies um, they also have a board of unicorn founders who will support these companies that these investors are in investing in and uh, support them and help them grow and scale to unicorn status for them as well. So we have a great long-standing relationship with Nigeria and hope the evening summer has been for the next few years. Britain's Queen Elizabeth has reviewed plans for her Platinum Jubilee celebrations with her private secretary in Sandringham, England, as she marks 70 years since she acceded to the throne, making her Britain's longest reigning sovereign. The 95-year-old monarch became Queen of Britain and more than a dozen other realms, including Canada, Australia and New Zealand, on the death of her father, King George VI, on February 6, 1952, while she was in Kenya on an international tour. She has continued to carry out official duties well into her 90s, but has been little seen in public since she spent a night in hospital last October for an unspecified ailment and was then instructed by doctors to rest. The weekend's low-key events are a prelude to more pomp and ceremony to mark the Platinum Jubilee. Welcome back. As leaders from the African Union's 55 member states meet at the AU's headquarters in Addis Ababa, they've condemned the recent wave of military coups in West Africa. Less than two weeks before the summit, Burkina Faso became the fourth country to be suspended by the Union after disgruntled soldiers toppled the government of President Rock Kabore. Let's remember Guinea, Mali and Sudan have also been suspended by the African Union. Head of the AU's Peace and Security Council, Ambassador Bankole Adeoye, said, Every African leader in the Assembly has condemned unequivocally the wave of unconstitutional changes of governments. Do your research. At no time in the history of the African Union have we had four countries in one calendar year in 12 months being suspended. Let's get more in this report. The African Union also denounced the warring resurgence of military coups. However, the AU has been accused of being inconsistent with its responses on the continent. Leaders did not suspend Chad after a military council took over following the death of longtime President Idris Dabi Itno, who had been at the forefront in the fight against insurgency. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres made an address at the summit via video. In it, he reiterated the UN support for Africa. The United Nations is committed to working with the African Union to strengthen democratic and responsive governance structures and peoples facing them. 
This requires leadership on all sides. For example, we have signed an important new framework to ensure the EU peace support operations are planned and conducted in full compliance with international human rights and humanitarian law. He also repeated calls for ceasefire in the Ethiopian conflict, which broke out in November 2020 and has killed thousands. And I reaffirm my appeal for a cessation of hostilities, humanitarian access and inclusive national dialogue in Ethiopia, the seat of the African Union and the country that is critical to continental stability. And I pledge the full support of my good offices to silence the guns across the continent. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed used his speech to call for a permanent seat for Africa on the UN Security Council and asked the African Union to form a continental media house to counter what he called negative media representation of Africa. Meanwhile, it is not clear whether leaders substantively addressed the civil war in Ethiopia's Tigray region. A newly reappointed AU Commissioner for Peace and Security, Ambassador Bankoli Adioye, said it was not true that AU had been slow in responding to the war by appointing former Nigerian President Olusegun Basanjo as special envoy to the country nine months after the fighting began. He said engagements, quiet diplomacy, shuttle diplomacy may not be usually reported. He said the former Nigerian president will be heading to war-hit areas this week and that the AU will provide experts from the African continent to back up his push for dialogue. In other developments, the African Union agreed to suspend debate by chair of the AU Commission, Musa Faki Mohammed, on accrediting Israel's observer status in the Union. Faki's moves last July drew protests from powerful members, including South Africa and Algeria, which argues that it flew in the face of AU statements supporting the Palestinian territories. Both countries pushed to have the issue put on the summit agenda. On Saturday, Mr. Faki defended Israel's accreditation, saying it could be an instrument in the service of peace while calling for a serene debate. He also said the AU's commitment to the Palestinian push for independence was unchanging and can only continue to grow stronger. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shatai, addressing the same opening session, called for Israel's accreditation to be revoked, saying it should never be rewarded for its apartheid regime. Two-thirds majority would have been required to overrule Faki. Instead, a six-country committee will study the issue. Staying on the continent, two months before the African Union summit in Addis Ababa, the African Economic Conference held in Sao Cabo Verde to assess progress in Africa's COVID impact response and control measures since the previous meeting a year ago. The meeting was hosted by the United Nations Development Programme, the African Development Bank, and the Economic Commission for Africa. The theme for 2021 was financing Africa's post-COVID-19 development. As the meetings wound down, I had a chat with the Principal Policy Advisor, Macroeconomics and Governance Division of the UN's Economic Commission for Africa, Joseph Mensa, on takeaways from the summit. Discussions are gradually winding down here at the Africa Economic Conference. What do you think participants should take home with them? What would you, what's the, what's, what are the key things that anybody going to the conference, going back home to the conference uh, would say? One, I'll say that, you know, there's been a number of innovative ideas that have been placed on the table in terms of financing our development efforts. One is, we should look into ourselves, which is domestic mobilization of resources. Um, that is one. But how, what, what do we mean by domestic resource mobilization? We should look into deepening our capital markets. That means that the stock markets around, across the continent must be deepened. And to deepen it, we may want to think about how can we merge these uh, uh, stock markets so that we have one African stock market or something like that. But these are discussions which countries have to do. That's one. Two, in terms of domestic resource mobilization, we should look into how do we broaden the tax base, right? Not necessarily increasing taxes, but broadening the tax base could be 
formalizing the informal sector so that they could also pay their fair of taxes. Look at the way that in many African countries, our government officials are the only ones who are paying the taxes. How can you make it broader so therefore even those who are in businesses and making profits may also pay their fair of taxes? Three, you've got to look at property. property. We don't have property taxes, right? So you've got to look into how can you find a better way of looking into property taxes so that people who own, according to you know, the area, according to the size of the house or whatever formula you want to use, um, we have to look into it to broaden, broaden that. So that's, these measures are there. So you have to look into whether pensions, you could use pensions uh, funds to, to support your infrastructure but make sure that you have the money when the time due, when the people retire, you have the money. So it has to be fully funded or something like that. So, and, and I think there are creative ways of doing that, and to look into that. So that's for mobilization of taxes, domestic mobilization. Number three, you've got to also look into the question of the amount of money that's leaving the continent illegally, illicit financial flows, right? Which people who, which is called, um, over invoices, under invoicing, um, and therefore we don't get the money that we need to be able to finance. And I think, uh, given that your um, TV network is coming from uh, um, Nigeria, uh, and I wanted to say this and applaud Nigeria for leading this charge on asset recovery. I don't know if you've heard about that, asset recovery, because of stolen monies that have gone out which could have been used for um, uh, financing development, a new school in a village, a new hospital somewhere, a road, right? All these monies have gone out. So uh, uh, Nigeria is looking into the charge on seeing how we can bring these funds back so that they can be used for development. Let's talk about the pandemic and what was the experience like in Ghana? I know we're still in a pandemic, but 2020 was a particularly tough year for many economies. What was it like for Ghana? Well, my experience, I was in Ghana then. I was trapped in Ghana because the borders were closed. Ghana's experience was first to l close the borders, close airspaces, and therefore uh, kept it closed from March till September. Um, and what it did was it went on restriction, um, also went to lockdown, right? So, but what it did is not the whole country, but in selected Accra and selected areas where they thought that it was uh, challenging. So, you know, when you lock down people, and this, this COVID also presented its own challenges, and, uh, you know, and I would say opportunities, forgive me, because people died and all that. No, one life, losing one life is as bad as living, losing 20 or more. But the question is, you know, you, if you have people locked down, mainly the poor, right? And these are the people who are in the informal sector selling uh, stuff on the street side. If you've been to Accra, you'll see them on the streets, right? Um, how long can you keep them at home? And the reason is that you don't have any, they are not registered. They are not in the, they are, they, they are not in the financials. So you couldn't do a transfer, right? Even if the government wanted to put some money in their pocket, they couldn't, right? So after a while, you realize that as a government, it's a challenge for you to keep them at home. Otherwise, otherwise there'll be riots, right? Because these people need their money. So he could, they could only do it for three weeks, right? But what, it, what could have happened, in my opinion, which Togo must be applauded. Togo had a different system where they used mobile money. They created that technology where they transferred money on your mobile phone, right? And I think this is an opportunity that I would want to know more about it and the African countries could study for the next pandemic. So what you could do, and the, the, why I say it's an opportunity, you can easily use the mobile money to bring financial inclusion. You get the database on everybody. You may, there are people who are clever enough to know who should be excluded or double counting and all the challenges, right? But that in a way, think for instance, if you were in Ghana and during that crisis, they transferred you 20, 200 cities for the month. A poor guy. 200 cities from the government? Oh my, I'll be happy. Coming up after the break, more on my interview with Mr. Mansa. Plus, the US believes Russia is 70% ready to invade Ukraine. 
Stay with us. Welcome back. And now to the concluding part of my conversation with Mr. Joseph Mensah, the Principal Policy Advisor, Macroeconomics and Governance Division of the UN's Economic Commission for Africa. Well, one of the most thrown around uh, words I think I've heard during the conference is debt financing, uh, debt uh, rene renegotiation, debt refinancing. Is Ghana on board with this as well? well Ghana, has to, Ghana has been borrowing like nobody's business. We have a GDP, G debt to GDP cl getting close to 80%. Don't we hear Ghana is always on the market? Ghana is raised some money on the market? And we're proud of that. Look, what I'm, but debt in itself is not a bad thing, okay? What is important is what you use the debt for. Like, for instance, your network, right? The owners of this network can say, we're going to borrow more to buy more TV cameras, have a better studio and all that, right? That's fine because it makes your work get better. But if you're going to borrow, right, mm -hmm. and use the money to pay, out, pay down your, uh, to transfer, to pay, you just use the money that you get, the new loans that you get to pay out debt, to pay down debt, right? It's just financing the no debt, so refinancing the debt, using new debt to finance. For me, my humble opinion, ministers of finance know what they are doing, but my humble it doesn't add to the economy. And finally, experts such as yourself say that Africa needs $425 billion uh, to recover from COVID-19. How should Africa raise this money? The 425 yeah. I started earlier by telling you about the domestic resource mobilization, right? There's a new, th there's a new th uh, 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 decision. You know the, how many Nigerians are outside? How many Ghanaians are outside? How many South Africans are outside? There's a lot of us outside. So why don't you come up with something called diaspora bonds? And I'll explain that in a second. You have um, those who live outside, you know, send money home. I send money home all the time, right? Remittances. Mm -hmm. And remittances are growing, right? Because of the monies that come home to, you know, either you are building a home or just an upkeep of a brother or a sister or something. These are so. I think, and this is done by, by Israel, by others, which they have diaspora bonds, they are citizens. Now, what is a bond? A bond is like an IOU, right? So the government comes to uh, Joe Atamensa outside, right, and says, can you give me $100, right? So I sign a piece of paper, and they, he gives me this piece of paper, and I give him the $100. So that piece of paper becomes my bond. And he promises that he'll give me some coupon payments on it, which means he'll pay me some interest, right? Mm -hmm. So what I could then do is that you say to mom, I'll tell my mom, or oh, my mom is not here, but my sister or something. Look, instead of me sending you $100 every time, let me buy this bond, right? And the return that the government gives me, the $5, $20, whatever you, is what I would give to you. So therefore, it makes it worthwhile for me to be investing in the country. Right, so you can have that bond to for citizens to hold that diaspora bonds to hold. But you would ask me the first question you ask me, what confidence do I have in my government to, to hold that money, right? So therefore, you have to do it in a way and link to this is transparency, accountability, all those um, uh, issues. Government will have to come clean. The books have to be opened because if you want to, you have to build confidence for people to be able to hold their bond because they may not want to. So apart from that confidence, you also have to find a way to uh, guarantee the bonds, the diaspora bonds, right? There has to be a guarantee so that in case there's a default, right? In case it's issued by a financing corporation in Nigeria to hold finance, uh, 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 diaspora bonds, if, if they don't pay me back, at least the government guarantees that I'll get my money back. Risk is not in our psychic. Look at the people who walk across the Atlantic, the, the Sahara, to get to the Europe. They take a risk. And one time somebody was being interviewed and said, why are you taking this risk? He said, being at home is even a risk also. Doing nothing is also a risk. While the U.S. accuses Russia of possibly invading Ukraine any day now, U.S. troops arrived in Poland on Sunday following a chain of command personnel 
as Washington reinforces NATO allies in Eastern Europe. It's not clear how many troops arrived, but a C-17 aircraft is designed to airdrop 102 paratroopers and their equipment. On Saturday, a small plane carrying the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division, U.S. Army Major General Christopher Donahue, landed at Red Cell Jansionka Airport following a few planes with U.S. military equipment and an advance group. Poland's Defense Minister Marius Blaszczak told media that the first group of American soldiers from an elite unit and that more planes will be landing in the coming hours. On Wednesday last week, President Joe Biden ordered nearly 3,000 extra troops to Poland and Romania as Washington moves to reassure jittery NATO allies. The Pentagon said around 1,700 service members, mainly from the 82nd Airborne Division, would deploy from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to Poland. The first U.S. troops reinforcing NATO allies in Eastern Europe and Germany arrived in Germany on Friday. A spokesperson for the command said in a statement that soldiers from the 18th Airborne Corps will establish a headquarters in Germany to support the 1,700 paratroopers being deployed to Poland. On Sunday, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said he was open to deploying more to Lithuania to bolster NATO's eastern flank in response to a build-up of Russian troops near the borders of Ukraine. Mr. Schultz said he would discuss the deployment of troops to Lithuania with the heads of three Baltic states who are to visit him in Berlin on Thursday. He nonetheless once more ruled out weapons deliveries to Ukraine due to Germany's policy not to send arms to conflict zones, a stance rooted in the country's bloody 20th century history that has come under scrutiny of late. On Sunday, White House National Advisor Jake Sullivan said Russia could invade Ukraine within days or weeks, but could still opt for a diplomatic path forward. Earlier, two U.S. officials said Russia has in place about 70% of the combat power it believes it will need for a full-scale invasion of Ukraine and is sending more battalion tactical groups to the border with its neighbor. Satellite images by a private U.S. company published on Sunday show details of military maneuvers at the Belarus border with Ukraine ahead of joint drills announced by Moscow and Minsk that NATO has called the biggest deployment to Belarus since the Cold War. Russia and Belarus have said they will hold joint exercises called Union Resolve 2022 on February the 10th to the 20th, aimed at training to repel an attack on southern borders of their alliance. And Russia has given some details of missiles and warplanes it's sending for the event. The new deployment and planned exercises are taking place at a time when tensions are high between Russia and the West over Russia's massing of troops near its border with Ukraine. Western countries have accused Russia of preparing to invade Ukraine, while Moscow denies it has such plans. The images from US-based Maxar Technologies showed that military units armed with missiles, multiple rocket launchers and attack aircrafts had deployed to Belarus at three locations close to the border with Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine on Saturday received another consignment of weapons from the United States as part of defensive aid totaling $200 million. Washington has said it will continue to support Ukraine amid concerns in Kiev and among its Western allies over tens of thousands of Russian troops amassed on its border. Over in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, Thousands of residents marched through the city center carrying national flags to demonstrate patriotic spirit amid growing tensions in Russia. President Volodymyr Zelensky said in a recent interview that Kharkiv could be the first city to be invaded by Putin's forces. In Kiev, Western expatriates marched in the center urging their governments to support Ukraine. Close to 150 protesters, nationals of Western European countries, USA and Canada carrying their national flags marched to the iconic Maidan Square, site of the 2013-2014 street demonstrations when dozens of protesters were killed in the final moments of former President Viktor Yanukovych's rule. I really, really hope that uh, everything can be sold in a peaceful way because uh, what I think is clear from our side, nobody wants war. 
Uh, Ukraine don't want war. Western part of Europe don't want war. So we just want peace. We want to basically live in harmony with Russia also. And uh, so I hope they can talk into or uh, find an agreement, mutual agreement. Moscow accuses Ukraine of failing to implement the Minsk Agreement, an international deal to restore peace to the east where Russian-backed rebels control swathes of territory and at least 14,000 people have been killed since 2014. This is where we end the program this week. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can watch this episode and others on ChannelsTV.com or check the playlist on Channels Web on YouTube for Diplomatic Channel. You can also reach me on any of the addresses showing on your screen. I'm Amarachio Bunny. I'll see you next time.